last year I read a story about an Armenian refugee who was involved in helping someone who'd suffered an accident whilst working in a factory in Paris in the 1990s. The story was shared by Major Peter Farthing in a Salvation Army magazine and it comes from a very reliable source, General John Gowans. General Gowans was serving in France with his wife Commissioner Giselle Gowans when this event took place. An Armenian man arrived in France as a refugee. There, he was converted to Christianity and became a Salvationist. He found work in a factory in Paris. One day, workers in one section of the factory heard a terrified shout. They turned to see a massive grey machine topple over. And sadly, the machine crushed a young apprentice, pinning him to the concrete floor. The workers rushed to his side and tried to heave the machine off him, but could not move it. Realising the young man was dying, one of them said, we should call a priest. There's no time, another man answered. For a few moments, the room was silent. Then someone said, let's get the Salvationist. The Armenian Salvationist hurried into the room. He went to the young man and knelt down beside him on the floor. He took the dying man's right hand in his own hand. And then he held up his left arm and clenched his hand as if he was holding an unseen hand. With this hand, he said, looking at his right hand, I hold your hand. And with this hand, I hold the hand of God. And then he prayed and brought Jesus to the dying young apprentice. In these moments, he was a priest. He was the link between the man and God who could share the hope he himself had found in Jesus. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, that's our job. Holy people are the great need of the world. It seems pertinent that we're talking about the needs of the world on a week when America inaugurated a new president. We hit the highest daily total of COVID deaths in England. And we're still living with the impact that this worldwide pandemic is having upon our families and our society. Today's Bible reading talks about the difference that living in covenant with God can make to us and the world around us. A very modern question would be, does it in fact make any difference at all? Surely people say God loves all people and welcomes them all into his kingdom. And this sounds almost right. The theme of love is woven throughout the pages of the Bible and we're told that God does love all people and it is his desire that all people will be part of his kingdom here on earth and into eternity. His promises are for all people and his blessings are abundant. However, these blessings are not forced upon us because if they were, then God would no longer be a loving God. Let's look at this well-known verse in John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. And that seems to be the message of the Gospel in a nutshell. God loves the world and he gave his son but the promise of eternal life comes only to those who believe in him. This is not simply about believing in the existence of God. It's about trusting in him, relying on him for life and godliness. That's what John meant when he said to those who believe in him. Now before you cry out, that's not fair, we should all have eternal life. Why is it only for those who believe? Let's spend some moments thinking about that. This verse is simply a description of what will be. And it's true of many things in life. For example, we cannot enjoy a buffet until we sit down at the buffet table to eat. We cannot enjoy a walk in the park until we enter the park. In order to enjoy these things on earth, 
we ourselves need to enter in. Imagine if I receive an invitation to attend a buffet or go for a walk in the park, but I decide not to go. Should I then say, it's not fair, you enjoyed the buffet and you enjoyed the walk in the park, why can't I not have that pleasure? When the choice was mine, I was given the invitation, but I did not accept it. I did not enter in. As far as our own spiritual well-being is concerned, we cannot enjoy the gift of God until we enter in. Scripture is clear that God's blessings are abundant, his promises are sure, and his gifts are for all. He offers and he waits for us to accept an eternal loving relationship with him. He does not withhold his promises from certain people and give them to others, dependent on behaviour or success in holy matters. His desire is to give to all, but he waits for us to accept and receive what is offered. And once we've entered into this covenant relationship, then we can claim the verses in today's Bible reading, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. We can claim it for our own. Verse 10 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And it goes on to say, Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's a before and after story. At the end of verse 9, it says, God called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You have now entered into covenant with God. But he made the first move. Scripture says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And like the prodigal son's father, he waits with arms open wide, ready to welcome us home and when we come towards him he covers us with a robe he puts the ring on our finger and new shoes on our feet this is what we were created for this is who we truly are we are a people who belong to god we are home in fact the moment the prodigal son decides to go home this is his woke moment he feels repentant his heart that was so closed, is now open towards his father. If we ourselves have done that too, if we have opened our heart to our heavenly father and entered into covenant with him, then God proclaims these words over our life. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Notice that verse 9 doesn't say you are a chosen person. This is because once we accept God's offer of salvation, we become part of a group of people who've entered into covenant with God. We're not alone. We are now a holy nation, a people belonging to God. The word holy is often translate, translated as set apart. This is why we often feel a bit out of place in the world, like, like we've got a different way of looking at life. Verse 11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. It's interesting that scripture mentions good deeds. Some people think we need to do good deeds in order to please God and earn his favour. They believe that only good people go to heaven. Well, the Bible teaches us the complete opposite. Only sinners go to heaven. Sinners who've been saved by grace. So why does Peter mention good deeds? It's because the way we live our life is a demonstration 
of the covenant we have with God. Remember William Booth said, holy people are the great need of the world. But who are these holy people and how did they get holy? Well, I can only speak for myself. I need a little help to be holy. Well, okay, a lot of help. God's standards of love and forgiveness are so high that I fall short and I need his love and forgiveness in my life before I can begin to share that love with others. My own deeds are not good enough. This is why I need to know Jesus. He is my link to God. Scripture says that through his death and sacrifice on the cross, Jesus has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. Don't we need more of that in the world, in our communities, in our families? Unity rather than conflict. And I truly believe that it's not something we can achieve in our own human strength. I don't believe Jesus was simply giving us a good example to follow. He did something deeply profound and mystical when he died on the cross. And this is how the human race in our frailty and sin can be connected in covenantal relationship to God who is holy and loving in nature. And more than that, we can even dare to be holy ourselves. Covenant life and holy living is not an impossible dream. It's made possible through faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. But in order for this to happen, we have to get close. We have to enter in. We have to let God in here and in here. Living, living the covenant life is about living in agreement with God in our thoughts and in our desires. This is our new identity. We are a holy nation, a people belonging to God, and our allegiance to those things becomes stronger than our allegiance to certain harmful behaviours or attitudes that we see in the world. This is often where the struggle takes place, moving from one allegiance to another, one way of living to another. The cross marks the place in history where that struggle comes to an end. Our hurts, our suffering, our problems, our burdens, our fears, our failures and our frustrations. This is where they're laid to rest at the cross of Jesus, where forgiveness is proclaimed loud and clear. And there is healing, healing for those who would come. To say yes to God's way and no to my way. Interesting that Mr Trump played the song My Way as he left in his private aeroplane at the end of his presidency this week. God's way is not my way, but my way could become God's way. God's way is marked by love and grace. And he himself has brought us out of darkness into light. We simply accept the invitation to enter into covenant with him. If you're hoping that God will show you mercy and pour out his blessing upon you, but you have not yet entered into a loving covenant relationship with him through faith in Jesus, then let me urge you to do so. It's a simple prayer but it represents something deeply spiritual and life-changing. Next week, Paul will be leading us in a special Commitment Sunday where we will all have the opportunity to renew our commitment to God. But today, if you have not yet entered in, then please take this moment to say this prayer and put your faith in God and God alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to accept your offer of love and live in covenant with you. Please forgive me for my disobedient and rebellious spirit, which has taken me away from you. I'm sorry for the things I've done in my life. I want to move from darkness into light. In the name of Jesus, I cut all ties that I have with things that are not holy. I turn away from them and turn towards you, my loving Heavenly Father. I put my faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Thank you 
for your forgiveness and thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. I claim your promise today that everyone who calls on your name will be saved. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.